Well, thank you. I, I think one of the uh, uh, advantages or disadvantages of going last is that everything you wanted to say has already been said, but the good news is I haven't yet said it, so I will. Um, first of all, really thank you uh, so much for the invitation and for this uh, remarkable uh, survey that you have done. Uh, it's great to be here with uh, Chairman Chung and, and uh, Minister Yun and so many other uh, good friends back here in, in Korea. Um, let me, rather than trying to sum up or in some ways uh, try to let people know where I, I, uh, I agree or disagree with uh, four really excellent, and I would say five because uh, Minister Park's remarks were also extremely important, uh, excellent presentations. Let me uh, take the survey's finding and see if I can uh, both give you some really good news, something positive to think about, and then end with some potentially really bad news. Um, but at least it's potential. So with that, uh, the, the three key drivers identified in the survey of the future of the fragmentation are, are China's rise and, and uh, its, its growing revisionism, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the decline of American leadership. And I think the good news is that uh, while those are trends that when the survey was done a few months ago uh, might seem right, uh, I think there is um, a way to modulate both of those, uh, all three of those trends in a way that uh, can reinforce, if not stability, at least a sense of order. First, if, as many have already pointed out uh, to this, this morning, uh, China is, today, is not the same China as we thought it was going to be just even a few years ago. It is a country in deep trouble, deep economic trouble, structural deep economic trouble. Uh, it is a country that has uh, failed to consume enough, has relied for too long on uh, borrowing uh, an export-led uh, economy when much of the world has uh, emerged and become wary of being dependent or overly dependent uh, on China. And it is a country that is uh, increasingly unable to regenerate the economic growth and potential that we thought was normal just a few years ago. It is more likely to become an economy that grows like most advanced industrial economies at two, two and a half, 3% if it's lucky, but never at the 5, 6, 7, 8% uh, that it has for so long, in part because its productivity is declining and most importantly, its workforce is declining, something that uh, absent large-scale immigration, which is not a likely prospect, uh, is something that you cannot, uh, cannot change. And so, as a result, I think we are seeing a China that is realizing that perhaps its strong ambition for where it was going to be five, ten years from now is different uh, than it was hoping. And you see this in its own behavior, including in uh, a willingness to start cooperating uh, with the United States, as we saw just last month in San Francisco, uh, but for the hiccup of a balloon flying over the United States. In fact, we would have had a more stable set of relationships in the last uh, 12 to uh, 14 months. There's no reason to believe that that won't continue for quite, for quite a while. So yes, China is rising, and of course China is a major player in the international system, but it is not a player that is going to overtake the United States. That is, that we are dealing here with a power transition in which one power rises as another is declining. Not necessarily. Secondly, with regard to Russia and the war in Ukraine, um, although some might have believed a, a few months ago, and unfortunately that included many uh, in the political leadership in Ukraine and in some other countries, that Ukraine was on the verge of recapturing much, if not all of its territory militarily, uh, and that it would have actually been able to inflict real defeat on Russia, it's now increasingly clear that that is not going to happen anytime soon. That the prospect of a military victory by 
uh, Ukraine, defined as Ukraine militarily reconquering the territory that it has lost, not only since February of 2024, but since this war started in uh, February of 2014, that that prospect is uh, uh, slim at, at best. And that has led to quite a sense of, um, of turmoil and, uh, and anxiety, not just in Ukraine, but among Western countries. I, I think it's well to stand back and remember what has happened in the 18 months of this war, which by any definition, and in any way you look at it, has been a massive strategic failure on the part of Russia. Let's start with a very simple fact. Half its army has been destroyed. Half the Russian army has been destroyed. It's lost over 300,000, uh, 350,000 people. I recall, uh, remind you that when 50,000 soldiers were left, were uh, lost by the Soviet Union in the Afghan war, that was sufficient to lead to a major, major outcry among uh, the, the mothers uh, of the Soviet Union, as they were called, and we're starting to see similar uh, activity emerging in, in Russia. But quite apart from its political impact, its military impact is that Russia has suffered extraordinary losses. It's lost 5,000 tanks and 10,000 armored vehicles. That's more or less what uh, many major countries uh, produced in, in their lifetime. Russia lost it in 18 months. Russia has seen a Ukraine that under no circumstances, whatever the specific territorial dimensions of who controls what, but under no circumstances going to let itself be subjugated by Russia. Even if Russia militarily were to achieve more, it will have a face an enemy that is not going to be willing to be part of whatever Russia wants it to be part of. It has revived NATO in a way that we haven't seen, including to the point that two countries abandoned neutrality, in the case of Sweden, 200 years of armed neutrality in order to join uh, this alliance. And it has isolated Vladimir Putin, who is no longer able to go to a BRICS summit or the G20 summit or travel to New York uh, or COP28, although I gather he's on his way to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which does raise questions about where the Saudis and the UAE think their priorities lie. And while I'm not here to predict the future of this war, I will predict that no matter what happens, Russia will come out as the country that paid the better and the bigger price. So then the third question is, how, what about the United States and its declining leadership? And we've heard a lot about uh, this decline uh, from the speakers here before, something I uh, am deeply concerned about as well. But I think it's also a good moment to maybe step back and look at what has happened over the last few years uh, in terms of how that leadership has projected itself. In Asia, it has projected itself uh, by a reinvigoration and revitalization of a set of alliance principles and, or, and uh, arrangements that have been extraordinarily robust and strong, starting with the revitalization and, in fact, the strengthening of the Quad, the introduction of leaders' meetings uh, uh, immediately in March of 2021 when uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, was president, a series of meetings that has now happened uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the creation of AUKUS, which brought in Australia into uh, a larger strategic role in the Asia Pacific, and of course, most importantly and most significantly, the establishment of a strong trilateral relationship between the United States, uh, Japan, and South Korea, with the extraordinary and, and uh, courageous move by President Yoon to open up this bilateral and trilateral relationship with Japan, which was long wished for by the United States and indeed many in Korea and Japan, but is now real uh, in a fundamental way. The trilateral meeting and summit in Camp David, uh, I think will be looked back to as a part of a strengthening of an international order here in this part of the world 
that is uh, to be uh, welcomed and um, seen and has to be seen as significant. Uh, Foreign Minister Park mentioned the AP4 uh, arrangement, the four uh, democratic Asian allies of, uh, uh, that have started to cooperate more and more, uh, including uh, by attending two NATO meetings. Uh, in Europe, we have, as I mentioned, already seen a strengthening of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, an organization that is now back to being very serious about the, the, the one issue for which it was, after all, created, which is defending the territory of its members. We are seeing a strengthened uh, European Union, which for the first time uh, since, since Henry Kissinger find, uh, so famously said, actually has a phone number that you can reach and there will be somebody on the other line who can act, in this case Ursula von der Leyen, who has emerged as a remarkably powerful and strong uh, leader in Europe uh, to deal with not only issues of Ukraine, but China and relationships with the United States. And finally, the emergence of the G7, as uh, Jake Sullivan likes to say, the Committee uh, for Managing the Free World, a uh, organization that now reads, leads on a very regular basis at the foreign minister, at the finance minister, even at the leader's level, to deal with the whole gamut of issues that affect uh, all of us in one form or another. Uh, so that is a set of strengthening of alliance relationships and cooperative relationships among the countries of North America, Europe, and Asia uh, that has been enabled by, uh, strengthened by the United States, but working very much in collaboration with its strong industrial democratic uh, allies in this part of the world, and has established the idea of a decline in leadership uh, as something that is a little quaint. Uh, it wasn't China or Russia or indeed anybody else who was called on, on October 7 to try to figure out how to deal with the challenge that we saw in the Middle East. It was going to be the United States and that will always be the case. So I would argue that we are in a world that is really not multipolar. Uh, it's not a world, it may be fragmented, but it is a world in which the United States, if and when it leads, together with all of its allies in North America, Europe, and, and, uh, and Asia, uh, is still able to maintain a sense of purpose and a sense of stability and a framework within which almost everything else takes place. And that it, as long as that remains the case, as long as the United States is able to work with these allies, it is going to be able to uh, work on a, a world that is in, in which stability, security, and prosperity is enhanced. Doesn't mean that there won't be war or conflict. Doesn't mean that there won't be economic problems. But it does mean that the idea of a fundamental challenge to that world succeeding, whether it's from China or anyone else, uh, is that much less likely. So that's the good news. Here's the bad news. This world order that has existed for a very long time and I think has been strengthened over the past few years is underpinned by a strong, democratic, outwardly looking, alliance sustaining United States of America. We may not have, come January 2025, a United States that is strong, democratic, outward looking, or alliance sustaining. Because we may have a president who doesn't believe in any of those things. So, this is a monumentally important year. Because the world that America made in that wonderful phrase by Bob Clagan is also a world that America can unmake. Not China, not Russia, not India, but the United States. And so what happens in our American democratic system in the next 47 weeks which will be a contest not just between two very old men, 
though it will be a contest between two very old men. It will be a contest about the nature of America's role in the world, in which for the first time since 1940, actually 1936 if you really want to go back to it, there is a disagreement in a very fundamental way about what that role needs to be. Unfortunately, the world doesn't get a vote uh, in, in that, uh, in that hair. Um, uh, that's that, unfortunately, because I think it would help uh, the forces who actually believe in the United States that is outward-looking, strong, democratic, and sustains alliances. Uh, but that is, I'm afraid, uh, the situation that the world faces and will have to live with one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man.